Hello and welcome to the Center for Collective Learning. Uh, today uh, we have a Scott Page as a speaker. Uh, if you've been in this seminar series, you know that we're exploring questions about collective intelligence and digital democracy. We are interested on, on how you know, people become smarter, not individually, but together. And I think today we have a fantastic speaker. Uh, I've been a big fan of Scott uh, for a long time. Even though we're not that far in age, I remember that I started reading Scott when I was a grad student. You know, and I was marveled by that book that uh, he wrote with Miller on you know, complex adaptive systems. And then you know the difference, and and I think you know Scott uh, Scott is a person that has many gifts, you know, and one of those gifts that he has, you know, which is something that definitely I would encourage you to learn from him if if, if you can by by reading his work and studying how he how he tells things is that it, he can uh, explore extremely complex ideas with a very simple and accessible language with with models that are very stylized and that really you know, are able to focus on, on the key mechanisms that, that are, are gonna matter. And I think that's, that's a really a talent you know, because uh, we live in a world in which there's a lot of complexity and a lot of people describe that complexity with, with more complexity, with, you know, with a lot of jargon or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, descriptions that sometimes are very convoluted and cumbersome. Scott doesn't do that, you know, he actually, you know, gets to like that definition of Feynman uh, in which he's able to explain things to, uh, to, you know, like your grandma or to a young person, even if it's a complex, you know, topic. So I've learned a lot from him, you know, uh, he's an extremely inspiring uh, writer, speaker and scholar. And to me, he's one of the most profound thinkers on complex systems. But within that topic, he has also done a lot of work to try to understand how groups of people become smarter together, not so much from an experimental angle, but from a theoretical angle. You know? So what are the kind of like the conditions that lead us to that collective intelligence in groups? And you know, uh, I, I think today probably he's going to touch on some of those ideas, but I think he's also going to focus on more recent work that explores you know, institutions. He combines political science and math you know, uh, in a unique way. And you know, I think uh, the, the fact that we have almost 100 people in the room right now, 100 now, it's, it's a testament to the fact that, Scott, a lot of people want to learn from you. So I'm going to leave the floor to you. The only thing that I'm going to say now is uh, just to clarify the rules, there's going to be no questions during the presentation. So Scott is going to get uninterrupted time to present his work. And after that, we're going to start bringing people to the stage so that uh, they can start asking their questions. There we go. Okay, That's take something. it away, Scott. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Cesar, it's great to be here. And uh, just a you know, quick announcement, I'll type this in the chat, but we've, uh, a, a bunch of us, including Jessica Plack um, at the Santa Fe Institute, we've just started a journal of collective intelligence. And it's really um, you know, meant to be a really interdisciplinary sort of place, not only academics, but also people from the, the business world and we're super excited about it. So if you have an article that you think, you know, broadly fits within this, you know, please submit it. What I want to do today is I want to talk about a, a project that I've been working on for over a decade with my wife, Jenna Bednar, who's a political scientist. And it's really trying to rethink institutions from more of a collective intelligence perspective. And I apologize in advance, we just got a, a new puppy. So there's going to be some dog barking in the background. And so it's tough to avoid. All right, so, so here we go. So what this is, is this is really a paper about how institutions allow us to produce collective intelligence. But the real focus here is gonna be on sort of how there's this interplay between the institutions we have and our civic capacity. Now, civic capacity is a word that we're just kind of like using to capture a whole bunch of stuff, which is kind of like culture. But um, Jeff Mulgan, who's also an editor of the Journal of Collective Intelligence, he has a wonderful new piece where he calls this dark matter. And so he thinks about this, like, so if your center is trying to think about, okay, let's construct this institution, this mechanism to produce collective intelligence, you're putting it in this kind of like Petri dish of a culture. And there's this dark matter, which is social networks, trust relationships, friendships, you know, cognitive capacity, you know, preferences, all these things. And that dark matter is going to play a huge role in the success of your institution. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the background for this. So quick outline. I'm going to talk very quickly about the field of mechanism design, just to sort of present that to uh, you know, a more general audience. And then we'll talk about the civic capacity effects. And I'm going to introduce this framework that we're thinking about, which we call kind of like institutional DNA. So instead of kind of doing one-off 
you know, dis decisions about should we use this institution or this institution. So if you're in the private sector, there's a lot of A-B testing. Should we do A or should we do B? And you test it and you think, okay, institution A works better. We're gonna argue that that's a little bit short-sighted from a complex systems perspective, because the thing is it could be that if you're like on a rugged landscape, right, this particular uphill climb may not get you to the, the global option when you wanna think of the full ensemble, as opposed to just thinking about each individual choice. All right, so here's the idea. When we think about the sort of cognitive tasks that someone interested in collective intelligence would be interested in, it seems like prediction, coordination, problem solving, designing, generating ideas, logically thinking something through, filtering or cultivating a set of ideas or organizing some sort of economic, political or nonprofit activity, right? So some social activity. So these are all things that are sort of lie at the core of the cognitive economy and really are at the, I think at the really essence of what, you know, Cesar has been interested in, I've been interested in for a long time, right? How do we get collections of people to be better at doing these things when these problems kind of outstrip an individual person? Now, as a social scientist, one of the things that interests me here is what role do institutions play in doing this? And historically, up until like, like the 1980s, social scientists used to say there's three ways to organize activity, markets, hierarchies, and democracies. But then Eleanor Ostra made this kind of like, you know, just giant breakthrough with her body of work saying there's also self-organization. So sometimes there really are no formal institutions, but it's sets and collections of sort of informal norms and relationships and things like that. And so when I was a graduate student, I took a class from the famous economic sociologist Art Stinchcomb called Markets, Hierarchies, and Democracies, right? And we were like, when do you use each one and why? And if he were to teach, there's the puppy, if you're gonna teach that now, you'd kind of add a fourth one in self-organization. Well, in the last five or 10 years, there's been even sort of a fifth one coming in, hey Roland, which is algorithms, right? Um, and you can think of an algorithm, sometimes algorithms are like markets and sometimes we vote like democracies, but I'm gonna distinguish an algorithm in the following way. An algorithm is a situation where it just kind of, you give it information, or it scrapes information, and then it does a calculation. So there's no real human in the loop here. It's just kind of like taking data or information and processing <laughs> for you. So if we think about human society, right, in our successes, you see this interesting picture of like, you know, a thousand years ago, income per person. This is Michael Kramer's work, who's won a Nobel Prize. You know, if you set 1800 at one, things were pretty steady for a long time. And then all of a sudden you get this amazing increase in growth. Why is that? Well, one thing you could say, it's, you know, it's, maybe it's due to markets, right? So that, and Frederick Hayek talks about why are markets so incredible? And he essentially says, because they produce this, this amazing collective intelligence, right? That you get sort of the whole has knowledge. And if you look at things, even like great examples from collective intelligence, like MIT's red or DARPA's um, red balloon challenge won by MIT, the mechanism that the people used to find those red balloons was a market, right? So you had to find 20 balloons, each one was worth $1,000. And what they did is they said, okay, the person who finds the balloon, or I'm sorry, 10 balloons, the person who finds the balloon gets $2,000. The person who finds the person who finds the balloon gets $1,000. The person who finds the person who finds the person who finds the balloon gets $500. So they created an incentive system, which allowed them to sort of generate diverse information and find the balloons. So you could say, oh, markets work, markets are great. But the thing is, markets aren't the only possible solution, right? Herb Simon essentially makes the exact same argument for organizations that Hayek makes for markets. And he says, look, it's, they can be understood as a machinery for coping with the limits of man's abilities to comprehend and compute in the face of complexity and uncertainty. In other words, the problem's too big for our heads, so we need to turn to organizations. And if you look, when I showed this to my undergrads, I'm teaching a class on collective intelligence, and I'll happily share that syllabus as well, as he's at, um, they were, freaked out that like Netflix has $2.3 million in revenue per employee and Apple has $1.9 million in revenue per employee. So if you're like, you know, making hot water bottles, there's no way you could generate $2.3 million <laughs> per employee. And these are cognitive firms, right? So the thing is you want to think, how is it that the collective is so much more impressive than the individual? And again, organizations can produce collective intelligence, but so can democracies, right? And this is, a, I know, I realize a bigger sort of focus of the center here in Toulouse, but like, Elaine Landemore, I think, is really at the forefront of this. She's like, look, there's really good reasons to believe when it comes to sort of epistemic reliability. Um, you're just a lot better off having the rule of the many than a rule of the few because we're dealing with complex problems in politics. I mean, everything from infrastructure to climate change to inequality, right? These things are really hard and there's no way any one person's gonna know it or a few, so you need rule of the many. And again, if you look at sort of like, you know, life satisfaction as a function of sort of like how democratic a society is, you see these upward sloping lines, right? 
U.S. is kind of sliding down out of late, but you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll come back up. And if you even look at something like life expectancy by government type, this is kind of amazing. I realize the, the fonts are small, but the teal, the small, the one up here at the top, the turquoise one, this is full democracy. This is flawed democracy. And then the, this pinkish one is authoritarian regime. So you just, you're happier and you live longer in democracy. So democracy sort of works. But then also, you know, when you think of the field of collective intelligence, there's also this question of ecologies, right? Or self, I mean, think of this as kind of like self-organization and Deborah Gordon and, and by other biologists. And again, this is the sort of area of Eleanor Ostrom. You know, you can get this amazing self-organization without any formal institutional structure, right? So these ants don't have a hierarchy. There's no CEO, there's no market mechanism, right? There's no voting rule. They just figure this out. And then last, algorithms have become this new way. Now, Tom Malone and I've had long conversations about this. He views algorithms as kind of like just an add-on, like, Markets run by algorithms, democracies run by algorithms, hierarchies run by algorithms. I view them as a separate entity because of the fact that algorithms can oftentimes just work on their own. They can use like satellite data, look for potholes, and then send trucks out to fill those potholes. And even if you think of a dating algorithm, it's somewhat different in that like it's scraping information from you as opposed to you sort of participating in some full way. And if you look at the effect algorithms have had, right, you see this like massive increase in the number of people like in dating, for example, which used to happen entirely through self-organization now happens primarily online or the, uh, the plurality is online. And if you look at homosexual relationships, that number is like 70% because it's a, it's a thinner market. <clears throat> so here's the point. If you look at something like the World Bank and you think, how do they do tasks? How do they do salaries? How do they promote people? How do they allocate time? What you see is they choose different institutions. And if you think of your university or you think of any sort of um, organization you're involved in, you'll see like some things are voted on, some things self-organized, some things, you know, the hierarchy decides, some things there's internal markets. There's been a bunch of work recently on sort of this move towards nobody having offices at work, right? You just kind of come in and find a desk. Well, that's moved from sort of a hierarchical assignment of workspaces to pure self-organization. And some places say, hey, that's working fantastic. Other places are saying it's a blank show, like it's a total mess. And that's where this kind of like, as Jeff put in the chat, that's where this dark matter, Jeff put a nice link to this from Jeff Mulligan. This is where this dark matter comes in. Okay, step way back for a second. This is kind of how I, what interested me and in, I got trained in as a social scientist, this area called mechanism design. So I was a student of Roger Meyerson and Stan Ryder and Mark Satterthwaite were kind of, Matt Jackson were kind of like leaders in this field. And the idea is this, there's an environment out there, right? That's preferences, tastes, norms, trust relationships, everything else you know, and the technology that exists in society. There's a social choice correspondence that basically maps the environment into some sort of allocation or collective decision that we'd want. So we're, what we'd like is some sort of collective intelligence that we'd like given this environment to make this sort of efficient, fair, you know, wonderful allocation of decision. That, and so the line across the topic, this is what philosophers would like to have happen. When we sit back and think, here's the world as I imagine it, as beautiful as it can be. The problem is we got to somehow make this happen with real people. So what you could think of then is that you construct some institution. That's the thing at the bottom. Given the institution, the people in that environment are gonna behave in some way. They say, oh, it's a market. I, I'm gonna bid, I'm gonna do this. Or it's a democracy, I'm gonna vote. So people behave in some way, interacting through that institution and you get some sort of outcome, right? And so this is just like, if, you, if you're trained as a mathematician, what you want is you want this diagram to commute. You'd like it to be that if I apply the outcome function from the institution to the behavior, I get the social choice correspondence. So a good institution would be one that sort of gives me what I want. A bad institution would be one that gives me something that I don't want. So if you read, like I was teaching this um, in my undergraduate class like last week and we were talking about Zappos move to a holacracy where they basically said, no one has any roles, just come in and do work. And the thinking was, is that like, if something needs to be done, someone will just do it. So their institution was just purely self-organized and their hope was that they were gonna get an incredibly efficient allocation of sort of shipping shoes. Didn't work, so they went back to somewhat of a hierarchy. In contrast, ING, which has moved towards Agile, right? The giant um, Dutch bank, they've actually sort of successfully moved from pretty strongly hierarchical to largely self-organized. All right, so if you think then, here's then the big idea in some sense. If you look across the world, and this is work by uh, my colleague Ron Engelhardt at Michigan, and you look at different countries and different cultures, and also this is true of firms, you see that there's differences. So this is 
what Ron does is he surveys people and then what they do is they use factor analysis and he finds that there's two factors, one of which is kind of like how survival oriented you are and how interested are you in just kind of like well-being. The other is kind of how traditional and how secular rational you are. And what you see is you see by region of the world that like Northern European tends to be more less interested in less concerned about survival and more interested in sort of well-being and more and more rational as a society. So you can map these things out. So here's how we think about this. We want to think of this culture, this dark matter as being a petri dish. And what happens is, is that when I place this institution inside a culture, I'm going to get some sort of behavior. Now, I was trained as an economist. And as economists, you start to think, oh, the behavior is going to be rational behavior. And if there's multiple ways to be multiple equilibrium from rational behavior, I'll use some sort of refinement technique and find the most rational behavior. And I'm going to say, this is what happens. But when you look empirically, that, is, you just kind of like, that doesn't always happen, right? So game theory doesn't always predict perfectly because we see that people sort of act the way they act. And so what can happen, and there's strong evidence of this, is I can put the same institution in the United States and in Sweden and get different outcomes. So for example, if you play an ultimatum game where I say, okay, I'm gonna make you an offer. We've got a hundred dollars. I'm gonna make Caesar an offer and if he accepts it, he gets his share. If he rejects it, neither gets a share. In the United States, people are likely to say, I'll take 70 and I'll give you 30. And Caesar's likely to accept it. In a country like Sweden, if I offered Caesar only 30, he would say, no way, right? And he would reject it. And so what I would do is I'd probably offer 50. So the same institution, the same game form is gonna give you different outcomes in different countries because the dark matter, the culture, the Petri dish all sort of differ. So. Here's what we want to think of, whether culture affects economic outcomes. Now, the way economists typically do this is they define culture really narrowly in terms of expectations and preferences, right? Um, and they show expectations, preferences have an impact on economic outcomes. So there's a huge literature in economics saying, well, preferences and expectations and trust relationships affect outcomes. What they do though, when they do this is they're so interested in it. This is an important research study in sort of looking for causal linkages, right? Does culture affect outcomes? They're ignoring, right, the linkage back, right? How economics and culture sort of have this interplay between them as a complex system. And that's what we wanna focus on. So what we wanna do is we wanna set actually embrace the causal link, right? And see how they, see what the interplay is. So here's the idea. There's culture and that affects institutions through these kind of behavioral spillovers, network spillovers, that sort of stuff. Institutions in turn affect culture. So if I, if I work for a company or in an organization, if I'm in a country where everything's market driven, I'm gonna become a very different person than if everything's self-organized or if everything's democratic, right? It's just gonna change what my social networks are like, what behavior, what cognitive tools I acquire, right? What knowledge I acquire, everything's gonna be a function, not everything, but lots of stuff are gonna be a function of the institutions in which I interact. So let me first sort of just show you some really quick, quick experimental data that sort of shows what I mean, and then we'll get into this paper. So with a couple of experimentalists, Yen Chen and Tracy Liu, Jen and I wrote a paper where we said, okay, let's suppose people play multiple games. So here's two games that are fairly similar. One is a self-interested game where you're better off, you think of defecting as playing to the right or bottom, where you're actually better off defecting. And the other one is a prisoner's dilemma where individually you're better off defecting, but collectively you're better off sort of cooperating, right? So standard prisoner's dilemma, standard sort of self-interest game. What we did is we had people play these in ensembles. So instead of just playing one game, you're playing pairs of games. And what you see, which is really interesting, is if you look at sort of this top row, the people playing Prisoner's Dilemma, the percentage that cooperated in the control group were 56%. But if you had them playing the Prisoner's Dilemma together with the self-interested game, that fell down to 42%. And so what happened here, right, is that like by being involved in one institution that's all about self-interest, you're more likely to be self-interested in another game. Now, we've, there's a whole, if you go back to this paper, there's a whole bunch of different sets of games and you see these spillovers in all sorts of different ways. This is just one sort of clean one. Now, another way you can get at this is construct agent-based models. And this is some work we did with a grad student, Andrea Jones-Roy. And we sort of said, okay, let's now like just construct an agent-based model of this automata sort of playing games. And you can think of a state, if you have a simple automata, you can think of it sort of a state of the automata being fixed. You can think of the state kind of matching the behaviors of others. You can think of doing the opposite of what the other person did, or you can think of it just switching, just switching back and forth. And what we find is if you look at something like the prisoner's dilemma, you can sort of do this kind of like almost like 
brain scan of the automata and you can sort of see, okay, um, how, does, how do these automata play over time? And then what you can ask is if I start having automata play a sequence of games one after the other, do they sort of build up a culture in the space of automata in terms of kind of like their brains look a particular way? So if you play The Prisoner's Dilemma, this one on the left, you see there's all sorts of kind of like matching one of the states in the automata, like the one represented by the horizontal axis, there's lots of matching there because the, the Prisoner's Dilemma sort of leads you to match. So what we find then is that um, whether you're doing it with people and experiments, and we've written a couple of experimental papers or with automata and also sort of mathematically, you end up getting this kind of like what institutions you have in play now affect the Petri dish or the dark matter and that affects how other institutions perform. So here's what we want to do. And this is kind of really, really abstract in some sense in terms of laying the foundations. But once we have these abstract foundations down, then we're going to write a very sort of stark mathematical model. So it's, there's a certain disconnect here that we're not happy with necessarily, but, but we feel like this is kind of at the moment where we can sort of make some sort of contribution, right? So again, we've got this idea of these sort of spillovers and now we're gonna think of this not as culture, but as like kind of civic capacity, right? Going back and forth between institutions. So what do we mean by civic capacity? And this is where this intersects a lot with the center here. We wanna think about what information and knowledge do we have, right? In the heads of people and also sort of within the society. What are the behaviors and norms that are out there, right? Cooperation, coordination, reciprocity, do people know how to deliberate? What belief systems exist, right? So there's a lot of evidence that levels of trust matter a lot in terms of some institutions performing well. How much corruption in there? What are people's values? So the belief systems is kind of like where the economists have focused. But also, what about networks? What social, economic, and political networks exist out there? And how are those a function of the institutions? And there's some wonderful work by Matt Jackson that you can find showing that like, World Bank projects worked in some societies where there was like really strong networks and they didn't work in places where there are other types of networks. So you can think of all of these things as being kind of like trying to, you know, pull back the curtains so you can see a bit of the dark matter, right? Or to sort of just put, I think, more structure on Engelhardt's notion of kind of like two dimensions of culture. You want to sort of say, let's, you know, break out the microscope and really look at what the dark matter is. And so now you can think of, you've got this choice between like, market, democracy, hierarchy, self-organization, or algorithm, right? And the idea is, here's sort of in some sense, the big idea. It used to be, or you know, mainly still is, when we think about what institution are we gonna choose, we focus on the allocation. Is it efficient and fair? So in the United States, big debates about, should we have you know, government provided healthcare? Should we have a cap and trade on carbon? Should we price carbon? Those discussions are entirely focused on what is the allocation? Is it efficient? We wanna argue that in addition to getting those allocations, there's civic capacity effects. You change all this other stuff. The difference between cap and trade, right? And a carbon tax is gonna to lead to different information and knowledge, different norms, different belief systems, different networks. And those civic capacity effects then become the new dark matter. So here's this, in some sense, a graph of kind of how we think about this. Civic capacity determines how well an institution performs, which allocations you get, but then that institution affects what your civic capacity is, which affects how institution B does, which affects its allocations, which affects civic capacity. So as we keep adding new institutions or we switch institutions around, we're not only getting allocations, we're getting civic capacity and that civic capacity is gonna affect how well other institutions perform. So, for example, let's suppose we've got some initial civic capacity and we put in a giant market for carbon. What that's gonna do from a spillover standpoint, if we count at the bottom is there's gonna, it's gonna produce a whole bunch of economic data, a lot of knowledge about budget processes. A lot of people who are environmentalists are now gonna think of the environment in a purely economic terms. There's gonna be a lot of focus on coordination, deliberative skills, norms, trust is gonna be incredibly important. Like are people cheating, not cheating, right? So you're gonna to have to really sort of leverage trust. And the networks may be kind of small worldy here, one would imagine if you think of sort of different industries um, producing carbon in different ways, you're probably gonna get kind of like little clusters of networks in terms of people sort of tr you know, trading these pollution permits. So what we wanna do, so that's that sort of big think abstract, you know, there's this dark matter culture, Petri dish, civic capacity, whatever you wanna call it. Now we wanna say, let's just do some really simple kind of like straight up MIT systems dynamics algebra for like, you know, sort of um, of whether that would matter and how much it would matter and what the implications might be. So here's sort of a simple way to think about it. I don't have the algorithms in here just because it makes the um, 
presentation simpler for a second. So now let's suppose we have this thing we have to allocate. It could be carbon, it could be tra you know, it could be we have a traffic problem, it could be, you know, we're trying to decide how we allocate offices in our organization. And we're sitting around, and we're saying, we could have a market for this, we could have a hierarchy, we could vote on this, we could just let it self-organize. How do we choose between them? So our model is going to be really simple. We're just going to say, let's just draw from a distribution randomly in any one situation, there's just a potential value. So this is the best it could possibly be between zero and one. So in this case, if we had the civic capacity to operate a market, a market would give us 0.8. We might not have the civic capacity, but if we did, we could get 0.8. The best self-organization could do in this case is 0.2. So in this case, this particular problem is kind of poised to be better, you know, just the nature of the problem, a market would work better. So we're proceeding from a position that any given instance of a decision that's got to be made, an allocation that's got to be done, some coordination, idea generation, any of those sort of cognitive tasks we talked about before, that it's some of these things maybe some of these institutions may be slightly better at doing that than others, or a lot better at doing that than others. So for example, if we're thinking about like people buying clothes, how do we allocate clothes, a market's probably gonna look a lot better than a hierarchy. Like I don't want a committee deciding what sweater I'm wearing in the morning. It just doesn't make any sense because the information's embedded in the person. So in this case, you think, let's just choose the market. So now when I look across an organization, when I look across the society, I can sort of say, oh, look, here they've got a market, here they've got a hierarchy, here they've got a democracy, here they're self-organized, here they've got a hierarchy. So let's look at a university. The university I'm at, the courses are determined by a hierarchy, right? So Oldest students, the students with the most credits to choose first, and then so on all the way down to the new entrance. Salaries are determined by a market. Tenure is determined by a democracy. And how we allocate time is self-organized, right? And we all just kind of choose, except when there's times when I have to teach my classes, but I get some choice over that. But like essentially how I spend each hour of my day is self-organized. What's fascinating is I was <laughs> at the, uh, um, at the World Bank presenting this. And I said, imagine how horrible it would be if there was a market for my time. Like I have like, you know, there's a little price on my door, like to spend an hour with Scott, it's $30. And then I'm sitting next door to Caesar. It's like to spend an hour with Caesar, it's $240, right? It'd be horrible, right? Cause everybody would like know their hourly price, but also it would just like, anytime we're just meeting someone in the hallway, I'd be like, okay, this is gonna cost you Caesar, right? Which would be really kind of awkward. and the room is dead silent. And then someone says, that's how we allocate time here. Because essentially everybody's on projects. And so your 40 hours a week have to be allocated to a particular project. And they feel like because things have to be allocated to a project and there is almost like a market for time, you lose a lot of the sort of just interactions you'd get in an academic environment. The point of that example is that changes the culture, that changes the civic capacity, that changes our ability to generate collective intelligence. So. You can kind of do this, and again, I'll share these slides. I don't want to like, I, I think it's kind of too overwhelming, but the idea would be that like, let's just take a market. Knowledge is kind of self-focused there. The repertoires you develop are kind of self-interested and strategic. Your beliefs, well, you know, look, you're, you're willing to accept some inequality because in markets, the winners win. And, and there's also this sort of incentive to maybe like risk a little bit. And the networks you construct are more self-interested. If you go to the other extreme, like self-organization, your knowledge is somewhat other focused, right? Because you're thinking like, what other people need? How do I make this all work? The repertoires are gonna be a lot of reciprocal uh, repertoires. You might become more altruistic. Your beliefs are gonna really focus maybe on the long-term and on trust and on equality. And the networks will probably be more dense. But again, this is just kind of like sketching this out in broad terms. But we wanna think about when you create a market, you get this stuff. If you look at Kurt Hofstede's stuff, and I'll type this in the... Um, Kurt Hofstede has spent like spent his whole career just sort of like looking at how different countries, this is Brazil, China, Germany, the United States have these sort of different cultural dimensions. And what you see, right, is these sort of like the uncertainty avoidance for the United States, like for example, in the United States is very different than it is in Brazil. Long-term orientation, right? If you look at um, China, it's 87, where in the United States it's 26. So the United States is very short-term focused. China is very long-term focused. This is again, another way of sort of measuring that dark matter. Okay, so here's how we wanna start. I wanna build this model up. We'll just do this pretty quickly, then we'll have time for questions. So I wanna start out by sort of making, I think what should be an obvious assumption that I hope is true, that there's positive feedbacks between these types of institutions. So like if I have democracies, I build um, 
institutions that support democracy. So the first thing is, I guess, want to assume that, like, let's just make as a base assumption, there's positive feedbacks that if we have a lot of markets, we get better at working in markets. If we have a lot of hierarchies, we're better at working in hierarchies and so on. And then we want to think about there being spillovers where like democracies may help markets or they may hurt markets and so on. Okay. So I'm going to start out super simple model where there's just markets, hierarchies and democracies and there's positive feedbacks. So here's the baseline model. I'm going to start with an institutional ensemble, which is a mixture of markets, hierarchies and democracies. So you could go into every country and you could just sort of count up or any organization say what percentage are markets, what percentage are hierarchies, what percentage are things are done democratically. And I think of civic capacity as just being the proportion raised to some exponent. And that exponent is going to be, I'm going to call the degree of vulnerability. And here's why. If that exponent's low, civic capacity is really complex, is, is, is convex. So I don't need a lot of markets to have a lot of civic capacity for markets. Because if I take 0.1 to the 0.1 power, I actually get something pretty high. If beta, beta equals one, then civic capacity is linear. And if I've only got 20% markets, I've only got 20% civic capacity for markets. So looking at this sort of graphically, the blue line is high curvature. If I have really high curvature, I don't need very much. This is like the percentage of markets I've got. I don't need many markets to be pretty good at running markets. But if I have low curvature or we're gonna high vulnerability, I actually need a, quite a few markets in order to get high civic capacity for markets. So what I'm gonna say is now the realized value of an institution is just its potential value times the civic capacity for that type of institution given the ensemble. So let's say, for example, the civic capacity for hierarchies is less than the civic capacity for markets, which is less than the civic capacity for democracies, right? Now, what I could do then is I could say, what's the, what are the odds then that I get, if I randomly draw these things out, that I'd actually choose a hierarchy here? Well, the thing is I need it to be that the markets were less than CH and the democracy actually had a value less than CH, right? Given their civic capacity, and so what you get is that I'm less likely to choose a hierarchy than I'm a market or democracy. And you can go through and do the math and all the other ones. So what I get then is I get an institutional choice rule that essentially said, what's the probability? Again, if assuming these kind of like uniform distribution of potential values, given right sets of civic capacity. So we've got this proportion of markets, proportion of hierarchies, proportion of democracies, that, can, that gives me civic capacity of each of those things that then gives me the probability that I get a market, that I get a hierarchy, that I get a democracy. The more markets I have, the more likely I am to choose a market, the more hierarchies I have, the more likely I am to choose a hierarchy. So you can think of there being an ensemble equilibrium where the proportion of markets I get and the proportions of hierarchies I get and the proportion of democracies I get is exactly equal to the proportion of markets, hierarchies and democracies. So I wanna think of this as a dynamical system where in some sense, what institution we use is always up for open for consideration and there's a chance I'm gonna switch something from a hierarchy to a market, or if there's some new thing that comes about, I may have to choose among the three, the ability, which one I choose is gonna be a function of the civic capacity and the civic capacity is a function of the proportion of those things. So therefore I think that whole system is kind of going to an equilibrium. So let's start out with sort of what we call high vulnerability with that B equals one. So civic capacity is linear in the number of institutions. If I write that as a dynamical system, what you see is that you just get three equilibrium. One is all markets, one is all democracies, one is all hierarchies, right? Because if I don't have, because I, if I only have 10% markets, I can only operate markets at 10% efficiency. So if I start out with more democracies, I'm just gonna end up with all democracies. That's kind of a, probably not a good assumption. And so that's, this is again where the math is kind of helpful and the model is helpful because we realize civic capacity probably is not linear. A more reasonable assumption is probably that there's moderate vulnerability. Right? If there's moderate vulnerability, I could end up at any one of these three sort of equilibrium, one of which is market dominated, one is hierarchically dominated, and one is democratically dominated. Now, if I make beta really small, right, so there's tons of curvature, then with even a little bit of an institution, I've got almost all the civic capacity I need. And what you get there is equal numbers of all three institutions. So if civic capacity, if the civic capacity doesn't matter, or if any civic capacity works for any institutions, you're going to basically get you always get the equal numbers of all three, or if one, if, if society was sort of, or technology was biased in favor of one, you'd get the right, you get kind of the right one. None of this stuff would matter. So where it really matters is in this mod, moderate vulnerability case. So one thing is the, that the math tells us is we really need to understand how much does civic capacity depend on the extent of these existing institutions. If it's linear, which it probably isn't, we'd end up with all of the same type. If it's in this moderate place, 
we could end up at any one of these three equilibria. And the point is these equilibria are gonna be inefficient. That's gonna be the key point. But if it doesn't matter, then we're just always gonna get the tough one. So the next thing we can do is we can add some spillovers. So we can say, let's suppose that democracy, because it builds trust, we understand people more, we are other focused, that it actually creates positive spillovers for hierarchies and markets. That being in a democratic society actually improves markets and hierarchies. Well, then you get this funny thing. You get the paradox of civic capacity building. If civic capacity has that form, then it turns out that you end up with fewer democracies, right? Because what happens is, is like, as I get more democracies, I'm increasing the civic capacity for the others. And so if I write down the system, I end up with more markets and hierarchies, which is both inefficient and also sort of a paradox because the one institution that's really allowing us to perform well, we're choosing less of because it's enabling the other institutions to perform better. Okay, so that's some basic building blocks. Let's quickly go to a general model then we'll wrap this up. So now let's go with five types, markets, hierarchies, democracy, self-organization, algorithm. And again, this is the sort of like, you know, we've had this move towards algorithm for like online dating and all sorts of other things, right? And as a result, we've had maybe a decrease in the number of corporations. So now same model as before, now I've just got a proportion of markets, hierarchies, democracies, self-organized communities and algorithms, right? And civic capacity, I'm gonna write is just each one of these things to some beta. Now I could have different betas here, right? In a more general model, but let's just keep it all the same. And I'm just gonna do a quick scenario. So I'm gonna first assume democracy spills to markets. So the little arrows pointing from S to S is just the positive feedback between the institutional type. And now I'm gonna say democracies actually help markets. So here's what happens. On the bottom axis here, what I've got is I've got um, the, this is the low vulnerability case, right? And this is the size of the spillover. So what you see here is the spillover is zero. I end up with equal numbers of all institutions. As the spillover gets bigger, as democracy actually creates a spillover, I end up with more markets and less of everything else. The more interesting cases though are this, moderate vulnerability, you see the same thing, right? Except for here, you end up democracies above the other three things, but you get this crash of democracies. So if the spillover gets a little bit bigger, you suddenly get this kind of collapse of democracies. And again, this is somewhat paradoxical, but it comes out of the math. If I make the, the institutions even more vulnerable, markets hang on for longer, but then they, they have this precipitous crash and you end up with all markets, right? So you start with a lot of democracies then you go to markets. Let's change the model. Let's suppose that democracy and self-organize, in addition to democracy spilling to markets, democracy and self-organization reinforce. So now I'm just changing my little pictograph here, right? So now I've got democracies affect markets in a positive way. Democracies and self-organization have this nice little sort of virtuous cycle between them. Again, low vulnerability, we're good. So if, if the civic capacity stuff really doesn't have a huge effect, right? You only need a little bit. Even if the spillover is large, we're probably fine. Moderate vulnerability, and again, let me just explain the left-hand side of this graph here. So the reason this is up here at point eight is if I've got moderate vulnerability, the equilibrium is asymmetric, right? There's gonna be one dominant institution. So I'm starting it with the case where the dominant institution is democracies. And what happens is if I got this spillover between democracies and self-organization, and then spillovers from democracies to markets, so I get this virtuous sort of feedback loop between democracies and self-organization, I've got a spillover from democracies to markets. What happens is, is that spillover gets bigger, democracies slowly fall and um, markets and self-organization, not just markets, both increase, all right? And in high vulnerability, I get a similar sort of picture, okay? Now, let's suppose democracy also spills to hierarchy. So now I've got, but this one I'm gonna have, it's a gray line, so I'm gonna assume that it's less strong. It's half as strong as the other ones. Again, if I start with low vulnerability, not much happens. With high vulnerability, I get this interesting thing where, you know, amount of vulnerability, like democracy kind of slowly fades, markets and self-organizations um, do best, hierarchy does a little bit better than algorithm. Again, you can show this as inefficient, but what you see is that, you know, there's kind of this smooth transition. And if I have high vulnerability, I get this sort of slow degradation of markets, and this slow increase, or I'm sorry, democracy in this slow increase of markets and self-organization. Now, let's suppose last, I mean, that, I'm sorry, that algorithms and markets reinforce one another. So now there's these algorithms are creating a lot of sort of self-interested behavior. They're collapsing our social networks. 
right? They're leading us to be much more selfish. And so algorithms and markets self-reinforce. So now that these algorithms are here, I've got this positive feedback loop between markets and algorithms. I've also got a positive um, in, in loop between democracy and selfish, and I've got spillovers from democracy to markets. So um, a question was, let me, this, let me answer. So the question is, how do I define efficiency in this context? So here's what I mean by efficiency. Each institution has, when I, when I come up with a, a new instance running an institution, there's a value from each institution, right? So the markets get a draw from distribution, hierarchies, democracies, self-organization algorithms. The realized value is that potential value times the civic capacity. The levels of civic capacity depend on the distribution across these institutions according to that function I've just created. So what I could do is I could think of this like an optimization problem and I could say, what proportion of institutions should I have in each of these five boxes to maximize the expected value from a new institutional draw versus what is the distribution I get from this complex system? I think of this as a, a compartmental, this is what we used to compartmentalize dynamical system. It's straight von Forrester, right? If I think of this as a compartmentalized dynamical system, I actually get an equilibrium distribution of institutions. That equilibrium distribution of institutions constructs a dis an equilibrium distribution of civic capacity. That ends up not being efficient, right? There'd be better ways, right? Be, in, in this particular case, we'd be much better off having more democracies, right, than we actually get because they create all these spillovers. So in this one, if we're in low vulnerability, right, What's interesting is right off the bat here, we start getting more markets. When we have moderate vulnerability, again, we get this crash of democracies and we get the rise of markets and the rise of algorithms. And we have high vulnerability. What's interesting is you can have a society that's largely democratic. And then when the spillover, remember on this axis, the bottom axis is the spillover. When the spillovers get large enough, suddenly you get this collapse of democracy, collapse of self-organization, moderate collapse of hierarchies, and this giant sort of boom in markets and algorithms. And the reason why is, remember you've got this virtuous cycle between democracy and self-organization. So that's why the two of those are kind of like working together and doing fine. You've also got this virtuous cycle between markets and algorithms, but at some point when the spillover gets big enough, you jump from one virtuous cycle to the other one and you move completely to markets and algorithms. So there's been a lot of talk about sort of the collapse of democracy. We're not necessarily saying this is the reason for the collapse of democracy. What we're saying though is that you can imagine civic capacity suddenly moving in the direction where there's a big advantage for enough of an advantage for markets and algorithms that they gain a foothold and then you keep having more of those and then you keep building the civic capacity so that those take over. All right, so let me just sort of sum this up one time for questions. So one question is how has technology, I think this is a key question, how has technology changed the efficiency of different institutional types, right? So how has it changed our civic capacity? How poorly might optimal one-shot choices be? So this is the question raised in the chat. Like, I mean, here we're just kind of like making up numbers and we can get fairly large differences between like what we realize what you could, but how, but how badly if we just kind of choose institutions using A-B testing in some optimal way, could we do? Could institutional refinements, if I come in and I like sort of fix an institution to get better allocation, could that actually hurt civic capacity? Here's a big question I think for your center, what data I mean, say there's a genius coming up with a really interesting data in this space. What data could we use to really actually capture civic capacity much better than Hofstede and Engelhardt have done it? And the big question is, could markets and algorithms, could their predominance actually destroy the civic capacity necessary, because that's just say for democracies, for democracies, right? As we move towards this, you know, sort of like space where we use more and more algorithms to allocate things and things become more and more market-based because technology allows us to, could that actually destroy the civic capacity that we need to be, to sort of create collective intelligence in democratic institutions? And let me stop there, because that's a lot, but let me stop there. Thank you, Scott. So uh, I hope you can indulge me with a few questions. You know, uh, there's Absolutely. some that are coming here in the Q&A and I'm gonna invite some of these people over. But okay. I had a couple of questions myself. Uh, okay. Before that, I wanted to congratulate you. I haven't seen this work before. Uh, I loved it, you know, and I think it's it's classic Scott Page in that there is kind of like a, you know, a stylized model at the center of it, but at the same time, it's very deep because at least to me, not only as a scholar, but also as someone that runs a private sector company with about 30 people right now, 
we're always thinking about how do we get to make decisions about you know tasks and allocations and who deals with the client and who's going to do customer services and, and who's going to like do the pull request whatever it is there's a lot of decisions that you know we don't only need to make but we need to make how they're made you know and i think this helps us think about that one thing that we've looked at a lot is the role of different sectors you know in determining you know a uh, different outcomes and a lot of that research for example more recently has moved beyond using you know uh, economic sectors and complexity to explain growth but to explain variations in inequality and carbon emissions and other things and, and part of the intuition there is that people learn institutions at work you know most people are salaried employees we don't get to be entrepreneurs many of us you know so we we basically, if we're born in a place in which the number one industry is, you know, grapes or, you know, copper mining or, you know, a software, we might end up in that industry simply because that industry is big. And the set of institutions that work for an industry are very specific, you know, so what works in a software company in Silicon Valley and what works in a coal mining operation, you know, it's, it's, it's very different, but it's going to spill over because uh, when institutions succeed, in the real world, you know, in an organization, it means that those organizations grow and they ingest people and they, you know, and basically they become dominant and they become kind of like, well, if it works for them, why wouldn't it work for other people? So we're very bad at seeing outcomes that are specific to specific activities. We tend to see the activities that are successful and we kind of like tend to assume that maybe we should imitate them even if their institutional setup is not optimal to us. So I wanted to push you a little bit there on, well, you know, what's the role of uh, um, sectors, industries in shaping and creating this dark matter and how that might push us, you know, towards like the good equilibrium, maybe the sectors that succeed are teaching us the way or to bad equilibrium, maybe they're generating spillovers to other sectors that they make everyone in Silicon Valley a techno libertarian utopian and they transport that institution, not because it's bad, but because it works on the context that they are operating in but they want to transport it to other contexts in which they don't work and vice versa. People that love democracy in Washington maybe want to have everything, you know, be decided that way, even in settings where it doesn't work, like let's say in the software sector, you know. So uh, it's an absolutely fantastic question and it's at the core of what we're trying to think about, right? So let's imagine you have, um, you know, a farming community where people have sort of like, you know, learned to be very self-sufficient, but also have really high levels of trust and amazingly high levels of reciprocity. Right, because like if my barn burned down or like it's about to rain and I need to get my crop in, that you develop, you know, tight social networks, high levels of trust, lots of reciprocity, but they're sparse, right? So they're sparse networks, but the connections are strong. One could imagine people that have grown up in that society could really operate some institutional forms really, really well, right? But they might do other things, you know, quite poorly, right? Where they've got to sort of have, you know, longer, you know, sort of larger trust relationships. Whereas you're right, Silicon Valley, where there's a lot of kind of like, you know, algorithmic, you know, this is all about me, you know, um, my human capital, they may not be able to sort of, um, you know, all allocate it or self-organize on the collective good as well as the farmers could, right? And so I think the industry is gonna play a huge role in what social networks exist, what trust relationships exist, you know, how much people are altruistic, how much, you know, whether they're, they're good at sort of developing reciprocal relationships. And so one would imagine then that the institutional choices in one region, the optimal ones would differ in Silicon Valley than in let's say Minnesota. But then in some sense, the point of the, the paper would be though that if you ignore the spillovers, if every single time Silicon Valley and Minnesota choose the one that's best for that thing, they could completely lose the ability to operate a democracy, <laughs> right? Or you could imagine in Minnesota losing the ability to operate within a hierarchy Right, because no one, you know, these are sort of like, we are, you know, Norwegians with self interest you know, it's sort of self-determination. I'm not gonna answer to the man or something, right? And so if you're unable to do that and the institution that would really work well here would be a, democ would be a hierarchy or democracy, then your society will suffer. So that one of the things here is, is it's a little bit of a kind of like an institutional diversity argument. You'd like to maintain enough civic capacity that whatever the right form of institution would be in terms of best potential value, you can actually get that outcome. It also calls into question, I think this notion of like, do natural experiments work, right? I mean, this is all the rage in economics, like, oh, this worked here. So now we can move it to this other place. Well, I mean, you just made a very compelling argument that that could be problematic if that other place has sort of had a completely different sort of sector economically, 
and the dark matter of the civic capacity is completely different. Yeah. So, the, but the I think the real question here is this is this is kind of a very big think sort of paper. You know, how would one actually do the harder work of the kind of stuff like your center does and your company does in terms of like identifying are there metrics we could have for civic capacity that would tell us which institutions will work and which ones won't? Right. So now we're going to start bringing people in. All right. Pierre Alex, a professor at the University of Utrecht. Pierre, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, it was an absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, I do have a question that relates to scale. Uh, yeah. Because I can imagine that the, the complexity of the system or the scale of the system actually influences uh, the efficiency of this uh, different institutional type. So when you, you know, when you use this example of, of dating, uh, where we see that we're moving from, uh, you know, like from meetings to friends or like a co-working space and moving to the algorithmic, you know, kind of, of world, uh, I can imagine also that uh, this algorithms, you know, works much better and provide much more value for like a large city than if you live in a small village where you already know everyone. So the complexity and the scale really matters for these institutional types. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. And obviously that, you know, pushes us to think a bit uh, deeper uh, in terms of like level of governance. So maybe different institutional types work better uh, at the level of a city and others at the level of, uh, you know, like at the federal level and others at the state level. So uh, yeah, I, I would love to hear your opinion on, about that. Great question. This is one that, you know, we're, I was puzzling over this yesterday with someone. So let's, let, me, let me go very small scale. So at our university and a lot of other universities, it used to be that like when I went on a trip back when you could travel, <laughs> I would come back with like a set of receipts and I'd walk down the hall and I would talk, when I was at Caltech, the, my assistant was named Cheryl. And I would talk to Cheryl and I'd say, here's my receipts and she'd fill out a form and then I'd come back and sign something. And, you know, and we had a, an interpersonal relationship and it was somewhat hierarchical, but I knew her, I knew her work, you know, we were friends and that, that created a social network that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Now it's all done through this thing where I take pictures of things, send it in, and there's a bunch of people in an office somewhere, not even where the main campus is because rents are too expensive, right? And so they're tucked off in a building. So I don't even know those people. And in fact, I don't even like their email is just like receipts at uofm.edu. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't know any person there. So the result of moving to that more sort of algorithm, it's in some sense, you know, different organizational structure at the, in this small scale form really affects community relations, I think, in a meaningful way, right? Because now when I think about like, you know, do we fire people? You know, how much do I care about their jobs? Do I know them? Do I know their families? All that stuff, that all gets lost. When you move to something like dating at the city level, I think it's really fascinating when you look at sort of heterosexual versus sort of same-sex relationships. The same-sex problem was harder because you just don't know when you're walking around. If, let's suppose 10% of the population is, you know, interested in same-sex relationships you know, you're not wearing like a hat that says I'm interested in same-sex relationships. So the matching problem, if you just do the math on that is a lot harder. And so that's why you see 70, 80% of those relationships are happening through online because it just, it kind of solved a much harder problem, I think, right? And so I think sometimes it's, um, and that, and you could only solve that problem because it was, there was, there was sufficient scale. And so I think there is an argument that like some of these markets and algorithms now because of technology we can solve things that have been self-organized. Um, even like, you know, where do I go for dinner at a restaurant? Like now, like it used to be, you just kind of go and there'd be a line or not. Now I can kind of sign up. And I think there's things like that, you know, that are just pure efficiency gains or like Waymo telling my car which direction to drive. But I think there's other things that have these spillovers that are much, much harder to figure out. 